In this episode of Detroit Performs, a group of students pay homage to saxophone pioneers. Eddie Goodman and I decided independently that we wanted to form some sort of vaudeville type group. Critic Card Detroit shares citizen reviews of the arts. Mosaic was wonderful. I had the best time tonight. I almost didn't come. My friend made me. Okay, and I'm glad I did. It was excellent. I'll be back. A young and yet distinguished Detroit jazz drummer. Jazz has a unique way of expression that I think that I would talk to a student and say this is something that you need to try. And a college student uses music to navigate his future. Renee Fleming told me um, after my performance that opera needs me and it awaits me. It's all ahead in this edition of Detroit Performs. Major funding for Detroit Performs is provided by the McGregor Fund. Additional funding is provided by the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs and the National Endowment for the Arts. And by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, I'm DJ Oliver and this is Detroit Performs. Now we are here at the Detroit Opera House, home of the Michigan Opera Theater. This 2700 seat venue has been captivating audiences since 1922. And today, I'm gonna to take you on a tour of this historic building throughout today's show. But right now though, let's meet up with some University of Michigan students who would have fit in perfectly during the early days of the Opera House. Creating a vaudeville act suddenly seen in present day, here are the Moaning Frogs. Eddie Goodman and I decided independently that we wanted to form some sort of vaudeville type group. He's very interested in the history and I've been interested in the history too, to a certain extent, and I just thought the music was really fun. And we happened to meet on the street corner and, and get to talking and we realized that we both were planning on doing this completely independently in one of those sort of serendipitous moments that led to something pretty cool. So we just kept looking into it. We decided we wanted a group of six people and we decided we wanted a bass saxophone, baritone saxophone, two tenors, alto and soprano saxophone. Went around recruiting members that we thought were uh, first, really great players, second, really great people, and third, a hell of a lot of fun. Saxophone is the perfect instrument for many reasons. One of them was that it can kind of fit its way into any style of music that you want to play. Classical, jazz, uh, those are the two things that I kind of grew up playing, but for instance, my neighbors were in a Latin band, and I could just kind of go sit in with them. Uh, my parents play a lot of Italian folk music, and I can just sit in with them. It's really versatile. It can play loud, soft, it can play sweetly, it can play angrily, it can just pretty much do anything you want it to. Um, and I think that's one reason why it works so well in just any style. We primarily looked at the ragtime era because the saxophone really increased in popularity and growth during the early 1920s. And so ultimately, we wanted to showcase that part of the saxophone's history. Nowadays, especially, you know, classical saxophone playing, like on modern jazz, um, we kind of forget that a lot of roots of all saxophone playing were in that time period. Um, and for us, it's just important to sort of enjoy that and expose it. To describe the kind of our shtick, I guess, is I would use I don't know, words like we provide a, a fun, unique entertainment experience where we've got um, good music, good music that's not really performed a whole lot these days. That's kind of that we've kind of uh, swept out from under the rug. There 
there's this big saxophone player named Rudy Weedoff, who actually was born in Detroit, and he was responsible for what's called the saxophone craze during this 1920s to 30s period of time. And um, he actually performed um, music that was from ragtime to um, just vaudeville music, just um, and really um, emphasized the, the the speed, the technique, the the humanistic side of the saxophone. The Moan Frogs play a lot of music, which he he played. We also play music primarily from a group called the Six Brown Brothers. There was a group called the Six Brown Brothers that was around in the early part of last century and they were a really big deal. And they were one of the biggest acts, performing acts around. So they would get involved actually in cutting contests, which were groups would challenge each other to see who would play the best. And so the Brown Brothers were sort of tangentially involved in that kind of thing, um, but that got their name out in the press. They also played in the circus, which was one of the best gigs you could get. You traveled the world um, and you got paid well. Um, at that time, and saxophone players and bands like the Paul Whiteman Band were the highest paid instrumentalists in the band. Um, and there had been a long history of really highly paid saxophone players. So if you wanted to make money, you could go into this business. <laughs> we started out just with a bunch of tunes, and we kind of knew that we wanted to eventually take it into a more vaudeville direction. To us, that kind of meant telling some jokes and kind of doing a whole shtuck. <laughs> I guess it just kind of happened naturally. One day we were playing a tune and one of us just started kind of moving around and acting weird, I guess. And we all just kind of jumped on it. It was a tune about elephants and it was called Parade of the Elephants. And Jonathan just starts kind of walking around like an elephant and we all sort of do that. That's the kind of thing that started the whole vaudeville aspect of it, which kind of took it more um, which made us more than just a group that plays tunes. I think it's a great mix of upbeat music, a um, little bit of acting, some people putting on different characters, dressing up, and um, we play really fun, fun pieces. playing music from this time period, uh, early 20th century, vaudeville, ragtime music, but we also, uh, majority of our pieces are arranged by members of our group. Um, I've written some things and a couple other, other, other of the members also. I've done a lot of arranging for the group, so that's one of the things that's, that's helped me a lot. It's given, given me an avenue to, to work on my arranging skills and do, um, do cool things like that. <laughs> I would have never guessed that our group would, have, would be received as well as it has. It's really great to see how this old music is being brought back by us and people are really enjoying it because you don't hear this music anymore. All ages love what they're hearing. I would have never guessed that the group would be sent to perform at the Kennedy Center. Uh, wearing the stuff that we do, moving around the way we do. So it's, it's a very friendly, fun group, and I'm very, very happy to be a part of it. Uh, I like to entertain. And you know, that's, I think that's what we do best as a group, is we present you know, fine saxophone playing in a fun, entertaining atmosphere that you don't see a lot um, in classical saxophone playing these days. And we think it's something unique, and you know, we hope that you know, people laughing in the audience, or you, know, you just get a smile and you kind of know um, that you've done your job. <laughs> So we have a good time with each other and I think that's one of the main reasons that the Frogs uh, is successful because we have, we have a good time and other people have a good time listening to us, have a good time. Yeah! <laughs> now that is some jiving music they're laying down. To learn more about the Monin Frogs as well as all the other artists highlighting today's show, you can go to DetroitPerforms.org. Now, I envision anyone that sits in these seats is eager to share their opinion about the opera or concert they just witnessed. Credit Card Detroit is the perfect platform for them to do this. 
Here are citizen critiques of other art events, thanks to Critic Car Detroit. Yes, I'm Reverend Dr. Regina Manuel, and I'd like to get a shout out to the Mosaic. You have done an awesome job with our youth in the city of Detroit, Michigan. <laughs> Mosaic was wonderful. I had the best time tonight. I almost didn't come. My friend made me. Okay, and I'm glad I did. It was excellent. I'll be back. I'm the mother of a young artist. Um, he's 13 years old. This is his second year, and I am just really excited to have him be a part of this. So you should really, really support Mosaic and support the, the adults that um, help these children every day to be better people. I really enjoyed myself. Dance along, sing along, it was so great. I loved it. We think Mosaic has better singers than American Idol. And the kids are so talented. We hear so many negative things about the city, but Mosaic is one of our jewels. It's a wonderful project, a wonderful opportunity for children to showcase their talents. Um, the kids did great. It's a lot of talent in high school and a lot of scholarship offers. We drove down from Port Huron, Michigan because a friend of ours saw this yesterday and said, you've got to see this. This is my first time coming and I was moved to tears watching this show. The kids were awesome and their energy just infused me. And I'm telling you, I will not miss not one more show every time. I'm spreading the word, I'm Facebooking, tweeting and blogging. I'm on it. You can view more of Critic Card Detroit Citizen Reviews on their Facebook page and YouTube channel, which you can find through DetroitPerforms.org. I now have the pleasure of being joined by the composer and general director of the Detroit Opera House, Dr. David DeKira. Welcome to Detroit Performs. It's a pleasure to have you here. How are you doing today? I'm good, thank you. All right. Now this place is stunningly beautiful, but it wasn't that way when you found it, right? No, <laughs> absolutely about that? not, yes. Well, uh, this house was built in 1922 as a, as a movie palace. But by the late 70s and early 80s, it had been totally uh, neglected mm -hmm. and uh, looked like it had been bombed during the war. It wow. Was, uh, and uh, all of the plaster work had come down. There was a piano floating in the, in the orchestra pit because the water was... Yeah. Had been for, for a number of years. And now it looks like this, huh? And so, yes, we bought it in, uh, in 1989, okay. and it took us six years to both raise the money and do all the restoration mm -hmm. and to build a major, major stage. We tore down the old stage, mm -hmm. and, and uh, it's a, one of the largest stages uh, in the Midwest. Mm, okay. And so, uh, which is ideal for large scale productions. Mm -hmm such as opera and ballet and major musicals, mm -hmm. things like that. So can you tell me what has drawn young people to the opera these days? You know, I think young people find the, the combination of the arts exciting. Okay. I mean, you go to a rock concert and what do you have? You, know, you have lights mm -hmm. and the, the know, sound, the sound, feeling, everything. Yeah, absolutely. And you see that in opera. Mm -hmm. And I think they're, they're excited by the fact, and they're always amazed to know that they that this voice of theirs, which they train, mm -hmm. can come over an orchestra, full orchestra, mm -hmm. and fill a house. Yeah, and make you feel that. And make you feel just yeah. it's the energy, yeah. the, the uh, wonder, and the beauty of the music, yeah. Yeah. and the and the drama which is being uh, conveyed. So yeah. I don't want to let you go, but I want to ask you one more question. Absolutely. So can you tell me about some of the acts you'll have here performing? next season in the opera? Well, next season, you know, we we present not only opera, but also dance, okay. some of the great dance companies. Okay. For example, Dance Theater of Harlem is coming uh, back, and the Joffrey Ballet, and those companies will be here. In the opera, we're gonna do, uh, we're gonna open with an opera by Wagner, one of the great German composers, it's called okay. The Flying Dutchman. Okay. And then uh, one of uh, the great Italian operas, 
called La Traviata, which most people that hear opera will recognize it. A lot of famous music in it. Okay. And uh, then we do an American opera by a contemporary composer called A View from the Bridge, okay. which is based uh, on a famous American play. And then we finish with a big grand opera by Puccini, Puccini. called Turandot. Well, thank you so much, Dr. David DiChiara. We appreciate your insight into this building and its performances. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Now, let's take a look at some arts events happening this week around Detroit. Young and distinguished jazz drummer Sean Dobbin Sound can be best described as hard driving, solid rhythm with a refreshing melodic sensibility. Let's take a look. I don't I don't worry about jazz disappearing. You know, I worried about um I worry about what it's going to mean to society, you know, and, and I, th I think it's always going to be there, but I, I just, I, I, I think as long as we're talking about what is true meaning to society or its true contribution, I think jazz is going to be okay, but I, 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 I always think that jazz is something that continue. it needs to grow. I don't think that jazz is ever going to just be, be done, I think it means too much. teaching day usually begins at around 9.30. Um, and I teach at either Oakland University, Wayne State University, Concordia University, or the University of Michigan, um, as well, of course, as the uh, Detroit Civic Orchestra Civic Jazz Program. Um, so after a full day of teaching um, at either one of those schools, then I come home and um, spend some time with the kids. I try to make, uh, help them out with their homework. Um, I warm up a little bit, practice, and then I go for four. Everybody ready? Everybody ready? Yeah. Ready to take? Yeah. Okay. One, I saw that, Grady. One, two, three, one, two. <laughs> that I uh, motivate young people to, to, to play jazz is that they have, it's their opportunity to, to really have some self-expression. And it's not to say it's not through every, every music, but I think that they get to express themselves in a way through composition, through improvisation. They get to express themselves um, in a special way that I don't think is, uh, is in any other music. And it's not to say that it's better or worse than anything else. I just think it's unique. Jazz has a unique way of expression that I think that I would talk to a student and say, this is something that you need to try. And it also teaches a student, um, I think jazz is the, is the music that teaches a student to uh, make those notes come off the page and make us believe, make the audience believe what you're playing, that you really mean what you're playing and that you're telling a story. So I listened to everything, but I, th I felt like the way jazz tells a story fits me the best.
For more information on Dobbins and all the other artists highlighted in today's show, you can go to DetroitPerforms.org. Now next up, we have performer Aaron Casey, who would probably love to be on this Michigan Opera Theater stage as he's quickly climbing the ranks in the opera world. The young tenor was chosen for HBO's Young Arts Masterclass series, where he performed with Bobby McFerrin, Renee Fleming, and violinist Yo-Yo Ma. Now here, Casey talks about his experiences with the Masterclass and what the music means to him. I deal with life through music. It helps me through the hard times. My name is Erin Casey. I am a vocal performance student here at the Moore School of Music, University of Houston. At first, I thought that I was just the average singer. And you know, that's a big thing. Even famous people battle with the insecurities. And I felt like it was hard. I, I couldn't really tell if I was good at it. People would tell me that I'm good, but because you have these insecurities, you just don't believe them. You would rather focus on the negative to improve and get better. I won my first national competition when I got out of high school, my transition from high school to my college career here at the University of Houston. It sort of was like that stepping stone that I felt like that I can make a career in this. It's been an honor to be a part of the HBO Masterclass series, A Young Arts Masterclass, one with Renee Fleming and one with Bobby McFerrin. Working with Bobby McFerrin was probably the most incredible experience of my life. And if it wasn't because of the University of Houston, I don't think I would have ever been selected to participate in something of that caliber. He knew what was to be expected of a great performer, and he could tell you what you should do and what you could do to improve your performance. Renee Fleming's Masterclass was the best experience of my life. I enjoyed that thoroughly. She's one of the greatest opera singers of all time, and she's my personal favorite opera singer. I do believe working with the people here at the University of Houston Moore School of Music, it got me ready for that experience. It helped me to know the, the terminology that she used and um, the way that she spoke about the voice. It helped me to, to perform and, you know, just show all of Erin. She was once in our shoes and when she was a college student, she knew how it felt and how difficult it was to figure out the voice and the, the different glitches and niches. Renee Fleming told me um, after my performance that opera needs me and it awaits me. It helped me to know that what I'm doing here is helping me, you know, because I, I did have the doubts. Is this the right place for me? With her saying like, oh, you're, you're getting good training. I don't know who your teacher is, but they're doing good work with you. It sort of like validates my, my being to be here and why I should continue my studies here and why I recommend this place for anyone. I listen to opera as a roadmap. I sort of feel like that's the end and I want to get there and be one of the best. And if I just let things get to me, I will never be that person. I will never be that great artist that I know that I can be. So just pushing myself and being the best person that I can be and trying to improve day by day, I think I'll be well on my way.
To find out more about Casey's experience and the masterclass, you can visit DetroitPerforms.org. And that wraps it up for this edition of Detroit Performs. For more information on arts and culture, you can visit DetroitPerforms.org where you'll find featured videos, blogs, and information on upcoming arts events. I'd like to thank the Detroit Opera House for letting us hang out here today. My name is DJ Oliver. I'll see you all next Tuesday. Thanks for watching, guys. Major funding for Detroit Performs is provided by the McGregor Fund. Additional funding is provided by the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs and the National Endowment for the Arts. And by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.